All right, so this is a quick session, so we'll start on time even a little early. Um, thank you all for coming, and I uh, want to thank Bob Estes for joining me on this panel. I, I won't read his whole bio, but let me just say that Bob's forgotten more about metadata than most people have ever known, so he's, he's the expert. We'll try to leave some. We'll try to leave some time at the end for questions. So, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of broadly cover strategy, and Bob will talk about some of the tactics for metadata. The session's based on an article that is going to come out in the Journal of Electronic Publishing in June, so you can look for that. Uh, we're going to talk about the theory and practice of metadata some um, processes of metadata construction, process improvement, and kind of the frontiers of the metadata universe. I don't know how many of you might be familiar with this film from 1968, The Powers of Ten by Charles and Ray Eames. You start out with a picture of a, a couple on a lake, Michigan, and every 10 seconds it zooms out by a power of 10 until it reaches the outer edges of the universe. Then they zoom back into the guy's hand, sleeping there, and again, every 10 seconds it zooms in by a power of 10 until you get to a uh, proton atom in the guy's uh, hand within a white blood cell. So metadata is kind of like that. It's both a universe and it's DNA. So metadata is described as a data about data. It's uh, really integral to the entire publishing industry and the whole publishing ecosystem. This is a uh, visualization done by Jen Riley at the uh, Indiana University. I, I understand that she's not at Indiana anymore, but she was when she did this, um, with um, Devin Becker as well contributed. And this is a visualization of metadata spectrum. You can't really see much detail here, so we'll zoom in. You can see uh, domains and communities, domains such as data sets, moving images, scholarly text, communities like the information industry, uh, museums, libraries. If we zoom in a little bit closer into scholarly text, these are just some of the standards. You know, keep in mind, these are not all of the metadata standards, so it's a little overwhelming. Uh, we're gonna talk here about Onyx and mention Mark Records, but uh, you could really go wild with different metadata standards. Of course, the goal of good book metadata is to make your book discoverable and hopefully to be purchased as well. So even though metadata is often thought of as descriptive data, you know, the author, the price, the title, you can think of it more broadly as information that describes some other information. So a book review is part of the metadata of that book, but it's also its own metadata. In another sense, a, an author is the metadata of the book, but the book is the metadata of the author as well. So it begins with very basic information, uh, product basics, you know, the title, the author, jacket cover, gets a little bit more, you know, catalog copy, details such as identifiers, and then even more information, author bios, blurbs, and it's almost infinite. Book trailers, sample chapters, excerpts, tags, other books. Metadata is the flow of information. So this is kind of shows how it's supposed to work. Uh, publishers supply metadata, sometimes through management companies such as NetRead or Firebrand. Uh, it goes to distributors and retailers. And you can see here there's a kind of two-way flow of information. It's very nice. That's not really how it works, though. Uh, this is really how it works. There's kind of one-way arrows instead of two-way arrows. The red arrows shows where metadata is being altered. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's messy. 
Book metadata has been around as long as the book itself. You know, back the Frankfurt Book Fair started out in around 1475. People had ledgers, uh, libraries, archived their materials and, and had data about what they had. Collectors would put it in account books. Of course, they didn't call it metadata at that time. This looks at Google's Ngram viewer. I don't, how many people have played around with this at all? So you all remember the Google Books project. Everybody knows about that. They digitized millions of books. They made the underlying data available. They couldn't make all the books available. But the Ngram viewer, you can search on terms from one to five word terms. So if you want to see, for example, the rise of terrorism versus insurgency over time, you plug that in, or, or Frankenstein. Uh, in this case, this is the use of metadata within books uh, from about 1960 to the year 2000. So you can see that it's clearly on the rise. Onyx is a standard that you're probably all familiar with. This is just a kind of brief snippet of Onyx. Bob will talk more about Onyx. Uh, but it's important to know that it's machine readable, but you could also you know, read it yourself. It, it has an inherent logic to it. It's important to know that it's, it's an ongoing transformation. So Onyx originally came out in the year 2000, the kind of industry group between publishers and distributors. In uh, 2009, Onyx 3 came out. Onyx 3.1 is the current version, but not everybody uses that. So you know, publishers struggle with this. You, you want to feed Onyx 3, but some people say, well, we only take Onyx 2, or we only take an Excel spreadsheet. So publishers kind of have to do whatever to get their data out there. Uh, Onyx can be literally hundreds of fields, and within those fields, there's hundreds and even thousands of variations. Metadata does matter. This is a Nielsen book study report where they looked at the impact of metadata on sales. And they found that when it had complete metadata, so the bar on the very right, with uh, basic metadata, this is not any enhanced metadata, but just basic metadata and the cover, uh, books sold on average 70% more than titles that had incomplete metadata. And note these two short bars, you know, whether it's incomplete metadata with no image or complete metadata with, a Im with no image, there wasn't much of a difference. So the cover image obviously is important. I, I like to think of metadata as kind of a process of continuous improvement. So this is something that it never ends. The process never ends. You could start with low hanging fruit, kind of start with some basic flaws in your metadata and keep working on it. One thing to try to do is reduce the number of different databases that you store metadata in. One publisher I worked at had five different depositories of different parts of metadata and try to keep them all in sync and keep them all edited. Uh, somebody yesterday mentioned to me that they were getting author uh, keywords and author, author information in emails, plus in an author form, plus on a web form, and trying to keep it all in sync and edit it throughout the process. So, you know, look at it as a process. A good way to start with this is um, by mapping your metadata process. So, I don't know how many of you might be familiar with Six Sigma or kind of process improvement steps. But this is a metadata flow chart. And it looks kind of complicated. Well, because it is complicated. Uh, but this shows different containers, when it's going into containers, who's handling it, you know, what parts of the organization are touching it, and where it's going. And this includes ebook metadata, library metadata, uh, retailer metadata. Metadata is uh, central to the organization. It really touches all parts, you know, obviously marketing and distribution, but also production, uh, royalties, and um, things like learning. For example, you want to get your materials into Blackboard or into SCORM, metadata is involved with that. Or tracking sales, ebook usage, metadata is involved with that. 
So it really permeates and enables all parts, all aspects of publishing. Some, some people say in business, money is either very important or it's everything. And I'd say in publishing, sorry about the fonts here, when you switch from Mac to, to what are these things called, PCs? <laughs> Doesn't work very good. Uh, so in publishing, metadata is either very important or it's everything. So a book industry study group has a program. First of all, you can find all the best practices on their website, but they also have a program that validates your metadata. You submit their metadata and they do a, both a quantitative and qualitative check on it. And if you get a good ranking, they will rank you silver or gold. And uh, some vendors will give you some prioritization. BISG is working on trying to make this more scalable. Um, but uh, you could contact them about that. And the feedback that they give you from this process is helpful in, in knowing where to address your shortcomings. So let's look at some of the frontiers of metadata. Um, you might be familiar with WorldCat. OCLC has this program. You could, uh, when, you, when somebody looks at a book, they could tell what library it's in. If you're at a university, it'll tell you if it's in your university or public library. So mark records are kind of like the library's version of Onyx. Not, not exactly, but it's a machine readable code. And libraries uh, can receive this directly from publishers. So if you're a publisher working with a lot of libraries, you could give them mark records. Although most libraries get them from OCLC or from other vendors. And they, OCLC also has an initiative to merge uh, your Onyx records. So if you don't have MARC records, you can send your Onyx to OCLC, and they'll send it back to you with uh, added information from, from WorldCat. Metadata is becoming increasingly interconnected. Uh, Google Scholar, Web of Science, uh, all these different databases, serial solutions, PubMed Central, they're all using metadata, and um, together they're linking data repositories to improve the architecture of the semantic web. Publishers can submit metadata directly to Goodreads and Library Thing. Now, they get metadata from other sources, so your books might already be on there, but if you submit it to them uh, yourself, it's going to be more timely and more accurate. There's always new standards in metadata. How many of you have heard of the ISNI? Anybody? Uh, quite a few. So Laura Dawson's been talking about this a lot. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a numerical identifier for a person's name or a place. It could be a character like Harry Potter. It helps publishers distinguish between authors with the same name. Uh, here's an example. Uh, I got this from Laura Dawson. It was not my own example, but it's cute. Uh, you probably know Brian May, who's the guitarist for the band Queen. Is he the same guy who's an astrophysicist and the same guy who has written a seminal uh, article about uh, stereoscopic images? Yes, it is the same guy. Quite an interesting figure, too. So who knew that the guitarist for Queen was also a PhD in astrophysics and an expert on stereoscopic images? The DOI, I'm sure you're all familiar with. This has especially been used with journals, but Crossref and others are trying to use it more with books. It's actionable and it's permanent. So it's a, it's a good thing to try to uh, add to your metadata for, for books. It can link to multiple things. As opposed to a, you know, a web link, you could link to retailers, to your publisher's website, to book reviews, things like that. Now, metadata is also a work in progress. It's, uh, it's never quite as clean as you want it. Um, I, my law, Warren's law is that it's always the author who finds the mistake on Amazon. You know, because they're always on Amazon looking at their book and their rankings. And they're always the one that calls you and says, how come you got the wrong author up there or something like that? Um, publishers always complain that met their metadata is being altered. 
Uh, the retailers complain that the publishers aren't giving them good metadata. Uh, Digital Book World said that 95% of the publishers have found that their ebook metadata is being altered. Now, I would say this is with print too. But ebook metadata has special problems because of multiple currencies, multiple formats, and also the print and ebook metadata, they don't like to talk to each other too well. YBP is probably about the only one that has been able to do something with print and ebook metadata. Uh, keywords is a very practical and kind of ongoing application in Onyx. Not a lot of publishers are using this. Uh, it's something you can add. Not all vendors will take keywords, but some do. You don't want to repeat the same words that are already in your title or your author field. So it's to supplement it. So if it's a book, for example, on World War II, you could have words like WW2, World War II, Pacific Theater, things that would supplement uh, and help discovery and search engine optimization. So you want to be specific, try to be unique. Don't be too specific. That's something would nobody uh, would ever search on. And um, try to prioritize, because sometimes they'll cut off uh, after a 500 character limit. At Book Expo a couple of years ago, I heard somebody say, metadata is the content. And this is becoming increasingly true. Social metadata is on the rise. Metadata is becoming crowdsourced and user generated. So as much as it's important for publishers to kind of control and make their metadata robust, they're also losing control because people are generating tags. Uh, you've got uh, places like Social Book, which Bob Stein has developed to turn every document into a conversation. Hypothesis is another one. Metadata can even become a game. This is metadata games. You can play metadata games on there. And um, I don't know how many of you might have been familiar with Small Demons, but they, this is a now defunct site, but they tried to kind of explode the metadata into content of its own. So for example, this book, it would say what music was mentioned in the book, other books, what art or what, what films. And finally, the novel becomes an API with metadata. Uh, Kate Pullinger's last novel, Landing Gear, uh, Random House Canada turned it into an API so programmers could access the data. This example shows you what happens to one of the characters in Karachi Airport. If you'd like a copy of the slides, go ahead and email me. I think that uh, also SSP will be putting them up. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Bob.